and be glorified with our lives as we proceed from this place. Lord, we love you and trust you in this place with our lives, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amos 4, verse 13. Behold, he who forms the mountain and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Similar to the video, we are going to start at the end of our section and go backwards to the beginning. We are going to rewind to the start. And this passage ends in verse 13 very powerfully, describing the mighty power of the one true God. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is the same God being described in Amos who we serve here in the church today, who we will serve for eternity in heaven. He's unchanging and eternal. Now, sometimes here in Toronto, we see the magnificence of his power and his might in creation. Not all the time, though. Toronto's pretty tame. We might get an ice storm and think, wow, that really shut down Toronto. That uh, made traffic really rough. That made the trees um, and branches all fall down. But I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to be out in the midst of creation. How mind-blowing it can be and how small you can feel when you look up at the stars and they're countless. When you are standing in front of the ocean, and it seems so vast and inexplorable. I've had the opportunity to lead some canoe trips in my life, and they are some of my favorite memories and some of my most terrifying memories. Because you go out in the middle of the wilderness and realize I do not have as much control as I thought I did. And it can be a scary thing. In one canoe trip, we went out and the waves were so high that we probably made it like 20 meters into the water before one canoe capsized. Another one was blown about a kilometer in the wrong direction and then had the portage back. One of them had to be towed by a boat all the way home. And within 45 minutes, all of us were soaked and defeated. I have been in a canoe, an aluminum canoe. How tragic is this? In the middle of a lake, in a lightning storm. Where it's pouring rain and you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. That strikes terror into your heart. I thought I was going to die that day. I have walked back to the place where I was supposed to sleep that night and seen trees falling over. One of which crushing a truck. You see the power and might of God and the glimpse of that and the power that creation has in a mighty lightning storm, in the wind, and you look at the mountains. Romans 1.20 says God's invisible attributes, those things that we can't see, such as his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation in the world and the things that have been made. And Amos points us to that in verse 13. It is God who formed the mountains, these huge monoliths, immovable, vast, beautiful. The God who creates the wind, something so mysterious, unseen, and yet you see its power go forth, its effect on the things around it. The God who makes the morning darkness, who treads on the heights of the earth, makes even the greatest things on earth seem small. A God so vast and mighty and powerful that all of the earth is but a footstool to him. You see in Revelation 4, something that she was mentioning as well in her poem, God on his throne with lightning and thunder, rumbling with rainbows and, and rivers of crystal water flowing from that throne. 
You see this magnificence, something powerful. Verse 13 ends, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. The Lord, that is his personal name. This is the one true God of the Bible, not any other idol, not any other God. He is the God of hosts, of angel armies, thousands upon thousands of angels circling his throne, singing his praises and his worth. Behold the mighty power of the Lord. And we're going to rewind back to verse 12, where it says, prepare to meet your God. And the question that is raised in our hearts is, who are you before this God? In the tale of two souls, where is your soul? Will this be a joyous meeting, or will it be terrifying? Because it is the same God. And two responses. Either you are his, or you're not. He will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or... Depart from me, because I never knew you. Either you will be prepared for eternity by living for eternity today, or you have only been living for today, for yourself. And you will find yourself wholly and completely unprepared for what eternity has in store for you when you stand before that throne. You will be trembling under the wrath of God against your sin, or secure in the Savior, Jesus Christ, who took that wrath upon himself in your place. Where will you be? Yes, you will be cast into eternal darkness, a place of fire, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Or you will be ushered into eternal praise by your God and Savior. You will be given the inheritance that you were created for, and united forever with your creator. With this God. With your God. This mighty power that we were just talking about will be forever beautifully displayed for you. The same power that spoke the earth into being and breathed life into mankind will be poured forth to bless and uplift you forever. That same power that made all things, that formed the mountains, creates the wind, that same power will be working for you to uplift you and draw you closer to him. Or, this same all-powerful God, unchanging and awesome, will include you among the wicked and the idolaters. The sin that we have seen in Amos cannot be ignored. It will not be treated lightly. It will not be brushed under the rug. God is just. Yesterday, today, and forever. So Amos says, prepare to meet your God. And in this context, it seems almost like a threat, something that should shake the people of Israel. Prepare to meet your God, because they think it will be this joyous time for them. When we have seen in the book so far that they have not been walking in accordance with God's word, they have been not, not been walking faithfully with him, but have been living for themselves. They have been oppressing the poor and living in luxury. I think it's a call for us to check ourselves. Because you may not be ready. Are you ready to stand before the throne of God tonight? Were that required of you? To stand before the King of all kings. The one who knows the depths of your heart, every secret sin, every wicked impulse. And who is well aware whether you have surrendered your life to him or not. Whether you have other people fooled or even yourself fooled. God is not. He knows your heart. He knows the areas where you are resisting him. He knows those parts in your heart that you are not surrendering to him. He knows 
the sins that you are harboring, the bitterness that you refuse to give to him and let go of, sees the depths of your heart. Because God knows his own. And his own know him. You need to check yourself. Are you in relationship with God? Are you known by him? Do you know him? Have you surrendered your life to him? If you haven't, if you're not serving him now, seeking to surrender your life more and more into his capable, his sovereign hands, if you're not honestly trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation, and thereby the implications that that has for your life, because receiving Jesus as your Savior is not just a nice thought, it is something that is weighty, heavy. It has implications on how you live, because if you are to be saved, you are united with a holy God. You die with Christ and are raised with him. But if that is not where you are at tonight, I urge you to behold the God who makes the morning darkness, who treads on the heights of the earth, and check yourself. Prepare to stand before him without delay, because you would much rather have the mighty power of God working for you, for your good, than to ever stand against it. rewind to verses 1 to 11. How do we prepare to meet our God? By returning to him. By repenting of our sins. By recommitting our lives to the one who gave us life in the first place. Where am I getting that? Look at the end of verse 6. Yet you did not return to me, declared the Lord. If you have your Bible, you can underline that if it's your own. Then go to verse 8. What does it say? Yet you did not return to me, declared the Lord. Okay, then go to the end of verse 9. What's it say? Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Verse 10. Yet you did not return to me, declared the Lord. Verse 11. Yet you did not return to me, declared the Lord. God is disciplining the people of Israel, and what are they doing? Not returning to him. God is doing all of these things so that the people of Israel would repent. And it's heartbreaking almost that time and time again, the people reject their Lord. Consider for a moment, as we talked about God's great power, his majesty in all the earth, Imagine that working for you. The greatest thing God can do for you is to bring you to himself. The greatest thing is to have you know and love and display his glory. Because nothing will bring you greater joy. As you come to behold the depth of his love, it knocks your socks off. The greatest adventures and joy in your life will be found in the Lord. The richest fellowship, the deepest laughter, the truest rest, and the most worthy pursuits you can go after in the days that you have into eternity are all in and from God. And so in love, God goes to great lengths to bring people to himself. Because this is the greatest thing he can do for you is to bring you to himself. So sometimes, sometimes that means some pretty scary things, and we see that in this passage. God mobilizes his mighty power that we might know that he is God and that there is no other. That we might repent from our foolish sinfulness and return. What he did for Israel, you see in verse 6, he sent famine says cleanness of teeth, and in this context, that's not a good thing. It means they were not eating food. So there was no food that was making their teeth dirty. They were hungry. 
he caused droughts. You see that in verse 7. People had to leave their homes, the security that they built up in themselves. They had to leave their work, their livelihood. You see that in verses 8 to 9. You see that they faced war and tragedy and ruin. Yet in all of this, the people refused to return to their God. And when we are walking in sin, God has all things at his disposal in heaven and on earth to bring you back to himself. And sometimes that means tearing our prideful hearts down to the ground so that he may build it up. Sometimes that means that there are idols in our hearts that we place on the throne of our lives that God is going to tear down so that he would reign there alone. Sometimes God humbles us, showing us how desperately we need him. And sometimes our security is stripped away. And that's not always comfortable. But when you recognize the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, this is the greatest mercy he can give to you. Is to tear down the pride and idols that you are holding up before the one true God so that you can see him past your own foolishness. Praise the Lord that he is so merciful and gracious to us. That he would mobilize his almighty power to bring you to himself. And when God is disciplining us, especially in our sin, it is always to that end, to bring you to himself. He wants your restoration. Proverbs writes that God disciplines those whom he loves, like a father disciplines their child. God is for you. And when your world starts to crash in on itself, which happens sometimes, even if you are a believer, even if you're not walking in sin in any specific way, believers are not immune from the troubles of this world. But when your world starts to crash in on itself, I encourage you to see every challenge, every heartbreak, every trial that comes your way as an opportunity to return to the Lord, to seek him, to depend wholly upon him to return. Where you have gone astray and you see that, God is not pushing you farther away. No. He is drawing you close. He's calling you to repent where you have sinned, to recommit and surrender your life where you have forgotten. Not everything that happens in life, not every bad thing, is necessarily God's discipline upon you because of your sin. I want you guys to know that, right? Not everything that happens because God is mad at you or God is disciplining your sin. It's not like that. But I would say that everything that happens to you should give you pause in your life. You should pause to check yourself, as I said, to consider your walk with him. To consider his monumental, insurpassable, his incomparable work should give you pause to seek and surrender to him, especially in areas where you know you are not. I'm calling you guys not to be foolish tonight, to remain in your sin and to remain in your pride, clinging to the remnants of what God has torn down and shown to be unworthy of your devotion. May it not be said of you, yet you did not return to when God was displaying his mighty power, when God was tearing down idols in your life, don't allow your own pride and sinfulness to be the thing that keeps you from returning and repenting to the God who is seeking your eternal life and his glory, your greatest good. There are two souls before one mighty, unchanging God. Two responses of eternal significance. And I will end the same way Jackie O'Harry did. Choose this day who you will serve. Because I say once you die, you cannot rewind eternity.